So if you recall uh, before, I mentioned that this idea of stoichiometric metric calculation that sounds fancy, it's not really anything tricky. It's really just what do we have to do to figure out how much stuff we need and how much stuff we're going to make. So if you're doing a chemical reaction, you need to know how much of the reactants you're going to put in and you need to know how much of the product you expect to get out of the end. That's the whole point of all of this. All right. So here's the issue. I don't want to really go through all of this. This is going to be your big key for this entire section. And in fact, many problems for the rest of the whole class is this little diagram. If you have a mass, mass A, let's say that's your reactants, and you want to know a different mass, let's say that's mass B, your products, the only way you can figure that out is to first put them in terms of moles. Now, why is that? Let me give you an example. Um, if propane reacts with oxygen, we get water and carbon dioxide. Let's even take a simpler example. Let's take an even simpler example. I'll put it up here. Hydrogen reacts with oxygen to get water. Uh, anything else we need to do to that equation? Balance it. Yeah. All right. Does that equation, just the way we've written it down there, does it tell us things about mass? Does that tell us that two grams of hydrogen will make two grams of water? No. No, why not? Because so many moles. Right, because hydrogen is lighter than water, right? So it tells us that you need two hydrogen molecules. And I think we've drawn something like this picture before. But you need two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule to form two water molecules. That's what that equation tells us. It doesn't tell us about the masses. Hydrogen's lighter than oxygen. So two grams of hydrogen doesn't make two grams of water. Two molecules of hydrogen makes two molecules of water, or two moles of hydrogen makes two moles of water. The point of, then this, or the, the point of this last part, then, is to make that connection between amounts of things, which is like counting and moles, and quantities of things, which is like grams, so something you can measure. So now let's look back at this other equation. Here are the types of questions that we're going to be answering now. What is the mass of oxygen that will react with 96.1 grams of propane in a reaction where propane reacts with oxygen, combustion reaction? So first, we need the equation. Is there a spot for this here? No. I should have left more space. Everybody draw this equation. It'd be good practice. Write the balanced equation for this process. Propane reacts with oxygen, producing water and carbon dioxide. And don't look, uh, does it say? No, it doesn't say. So just draw it, draw it out. Everybody agree with that? Does that work? Is that balanced? OK. So that's the equation. Now if we have 96 grams of propane, and we want to know how much oxygen we need, this tells us that there's a 1 to 5 ratio of propane to oxygen. So do we just multiply the 96 by 5? No. Why? That's right, because the mole may not be proportional to the grams, because they'll, they both have different um, molar masses. So we first have to go to moles, and then we can do that. So let's, let's go through these steps. We set up the equation, we balanced it, and then you convert the mass of the substance given to moles. Right? So I did this one here for you. 96.1 grams of C3H8, if it's 44 grams per mole, means we have 2.18 moles C3H8. Now to figure out how much oxygen we need, we take the mole ratio. That is, we look at the ratio of the moles or molecules of the two. We'll go back up to our equation. And we see that propane to oxygen is a 1 to 5 ratio, right? 
So you can think of this however you want to think of this. This one is a little bit easier, but it'll get a little bit trickier. One thing that I recommend is you set up the mole ratio like a conversion type thing. You can set up a fraction or the ratio of one or to another. So let's say we, want, we know that we have this many moles of propane and we want moles of oxygen. We can set up a proportion like this, or a ratio like this, and we can get the numbers for that from the equation. If we know there's five of these for every one of these, we can set up a conversion like that. Moles of propane cancel, and we're left with moles of oxygen. So that's going to be about how, that's going to be what, about uh, 11 moles of oxygen or something? 10.9? All right. So that was number five. And then for the final step of the problem, because it asked what the mass is that we need, we convert this back to mass, so we say 10.9 moles of oxygen times how many moles, how many grams per mole in oxygen? 32. All right, and then you've got your mass of oxygen, which is what about three. 53. What is it? 3. All right, so that's how much oxygen we want to put in. Now, using that method, we could have solved also for the amount of one of these products that we formed using the exact same procedure. Once you have the balanced equation set up and you know one of them, you can figure out any of the other ones. You can figure out the mass from any of the other ones using that exact same procedure. So this is something that you definitely want to be able to do. Um, and also, think about the other stuff that kind of it requires. So you, need, you needed to know the formulas of the reactants and products. C3H8 was given, but you needed to know that oxygen was O2, not just O. You needed to know the formulas for carbon dioxide and water. You needed to be able to balance that equation, and then you could do this. So that's where... Um, all this stuff is kind of cumulative because you need to know the names of things, you need to know the formulas, you need to have those correct so that you can then solve the correct um, ratios. So let's try another one a little bit trickier. Baking soda is used in as, as an antacid. It neutralizes excess hydrochloric acid secreted by the stomach. Anybody ever eat baking soda when your stomach is upset? Yeah, not a very popular one. Um, kind of gross. Milk of magnesia, which is an aqueous suspension of ma magnesium hydroxide, is also used as an acid. Anybody had that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Does it? Yeah, it's a good one. So which is the more effective antacid per gram? Not circumstantially, but actually quantitatively. Um, sodium bicarbonate or magnesium hydroxide. So what this is really asking is, which one is going to neutralize the most acid per gram, right? So we have to make a reaction of this reacting with acid and then do some calculations um, using that. So let's do that. Let's first write out these equations. So first, we would take something like the sodium bicarbonate, the baking soda, and react it with acid. Now, you can pick whatever acid you want, but the major acid in the stomach is HCl. And what would be the product of that reaction? Right. So this is like the reactions we did in lab, where you form carbonic acid, H2CO3, but that quickly um, becomes, that quickly breaks down into carbon dioxide and water. 
Uh, is that balanced? It is. It is. Okay. Um, so let's look at the other one then, magnesium hydroxide. We're also going to react that with HCl. What does that form? There's no CO2 formed here. We're not for, this isn't a, um, there's no carbon here. There's no way for this to form gas. So this is going to be magnesium chloride and water. This is a standard acid-base reaction. All right, is that one balanced? No, no. What do you have to do here? Yep, so we need two of these and we need Two water, right? Okay. All right, so those are our two reactions. Both of those things reacting with acid. And now, what do we have to do to calculate which one is more effective per gram? In other words, which one neutralizes the most HCl per gram? Right, so we're going to assume one gram of each of them and find how many moles that is. So for one gram, we'll say 1.00 gram of sodium bicarbonate times the molar mass of that, uh, which is what? Anybody? What, 84? Mm -hmm. Equals? So that's how many moles of sodium bicarbonate we have. And let's, let's go through and do this whole thing, and then you can try it for the next one. So if we have 0 0.0119 moles of sodium bicarbonate, how many moles of HCl can we neutralize? Or will, how many moles of HCl will it react with? The same, because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So even though it doesn't really mean anything, let's write it all out just to be consistent. So 0 0.0119 moles NaHCO3. And then from the equation, we get that it's a one-to-one -one ratio of bicarbonate to HCl. So that means we react with also 0 0.0119 mole of HCl. OK. And then we can convert that to grams also. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, you're right. So how many grams is that? All right. So one gram of bicarbonate will neutralize 0.428 grams of HCl. Now see if you can do the same thing, and then we'll do it together for the other equation. Do the same process, but figure out how much HCl one gram of magnesium hydroxide neutralizes. Sounds like you guys got it. We're going to do the same thing. Assume some quantity, the same quantity on both sides, because we want to compare them. What's the molar mass of magnesium hydroxide? So how many moles is that? Oh, 
0172. Now what's different about this one? Right, if we look at the equation up here, we see that there's a 1 to 2 ratio between magnesium hydroxide and HCl. So that means that in the second part, Or whoops, you're right. Sorry, I was just copying everything from the previous one. So that's magnesium hydroxide, right? So we've got 0 0.0172 magnesium hydroxide, moles of magnesium hydroxide. And now we're going to multiply that by a conversion factor that will give us moles of HCl from moles of magnesium hydroxide. So that would be one of these for two of these, because that's what we get from the equation. So that means we've got essentially double the, the amount of moles, right? So that's 0 0.034 something moles. OK. And actually, for the, to answer this question, you don't really need to convert it, but let's go through it anyway. One point two four. Okay, so now we have two numbers that we can compare. And clearly, the magnesium hydroxide is neutralizing quite a bit more, right? Yes. Yeah. So almost, almost three times, almost three times the amount. And we're actually going to do an experiment like this in lab um, in a couple weeks, where we, neutral, we use different antacids and try to figure out which one's more effective. Okay. So now we've got that. And this is, again, the kind of thing that you just want to practice as many times as it takes to get this, because it's going to happen over and over again. Whenever we have an equation now, and we know a quantity of one of them, we can find all the other quantities of all the other ones. So the next part of that is, what happens when they, don't, when they aren't all even? What happens if the reaction is somehow limited? And here's the pizza example that I was trying to find the other day in the book. So you're trying to make pizza. You have, you need crust, you need cheese, you need sauce. If you don't know about pizza, substitute a different food that has three things in it. <laughs> so if you have four crusts, you can make four pizzas, right? Let's say each, each pizza, I guess we should actually specify what that takes. So each pizza requires one crust, five ounces tomato sauce, and two cups of cheese. Yeah, me too, actually. We go for some pizza right now. Um, so each crust can make a pizza. So you got four crusts, you can make four pizzas. Ten cups of cheese, you need two cups of cheese per pizza, you can make five pizzas. And let's say you have 15 ounces of tomato sauce, you need five ounces per pizza, so that's enough to make three pizzas, right? So if you put all of these things together to make pizza, how many pizzas can you make? Three. Just three, right? Because the tomato sauce limits the amount of pizza. So you can make three pizzas, and then you will have leftover crust and leftover cheese. You can make delicious cheesy bread, but you won't have any sauce to dip in it. So you have to get the ranch out of the fridge or something. Anyway, you get three pizzas, right? So this is the whole point. And it's, it's really not a difficult concept, but applying it to uh, the chemicals, sometimes people get a little confused. So, Let's just emphasize that it's the same thing. You look at how much of everything you have, you figure out which one you have the least of, and that's how many things you can make. All right? Is that fairly straightforward? Okay, let's try a chemical example now. Here's ammonia. Nitrogen and hydrogen react to produce ammonia. It actually takes a lot of energy to do this. Um, it's a really important industrial uh, chemical process. Let's look at situation number one. If three nitrogen molecules and nine 
hydrogen molecules are added to a reaction vessel, is there a stoichiometric mixture, meaning is there exactly enough to react with each other, or is there going to be something left over? And why? How do you know? The ratio is just times two, or three. Right. So you're right. It is exact. Let's go through this. Let's, let's look at how we would do this systematically, meaning like following steps, even though you can probably look at it and figure it out for this one. Let's say you had three nitrogen molecules or moles. What we would do is we would multiply that by the conversion factor given in the equation. So you need one, whoops, you need three hydrogens for every one nitrogen, right? That's what the equation tells us. Which means we need nine hydrogen molecules if we have three. And then the, the thing tells us, oh, we have nine hydrogen molecules. Well, great. Then everything must line up just right, and there's nothing extra. So let's look at the next question. If we added five molecules of nitrogen and nine molecules of hydrogen, is that stoichiometric? No. No. And here it's kind of worked out here, right? The ratio is 1 to 3, but we're given a ratio of 5 to 9, which is not 1 to 3. Right? It's less. So we can see that we need more hydrogen. And here is what would actually happen then. There's a typo there. Let's say we had five nitrogens and nine hydrogens. Based on that equation before, all you could make is six ammonias, and then you'd have two leftover nitrogens, because the two couldn't react. We're limited by the smallest one, which is the, the hydrogen, the smallest one ratio-wise. So let's try this from a mass perspective and do it again. We're going to practice this a couple of times. Let's say same equation. Remember, let's recall the original equation here. N2 plus 3H2 equals 3NH3. OK. If 25 kilograms of nitrogen and 5 kilograms of hydrogen are reacted, here are the things that you'll need to know that you'll need to be able to calculate from this. First of all, which one is limiting, if, you, if any of them? What would be the mass of ammonia produced? And then if there's an excess of something, how much of the excess is left over? Let's go through how to, um, how to look at those questions, or how to go through those questions. First of all, what do you think you do first? Moles, yeah. You're always going to put them in moles. Does it matter if we start with the nitrogen or the hydrogen? No. You just pick one and start with it. We'll go from there. So in fact, it's probably worthwhile, or we're going to need to, need to know both of them. So we might as well just convert all masses into moles first. So 25,000 grams of nitrogen. is how many moles? Actually, I've got that. That is 893 moles. And then the 5,000 grams of hydrogen, it's about 5,000 moles, right? Oh, yeah, 2, 2, you're right, you're right. So that's 2,500. OK. How do we figure out which one is limiting? Well, remember, it's not the lower number. It's the lower one ratio-wise. Because we know they have to be in a 1 to 3 ratio. So what you do is you pick one of them and figure out how many of the other you would need if 
for them to be even. So let's say we pick nitrogen. If we have 893 moles nitrogen, the equation tells us that we need 3 moles of hydrogen for every 1 mole of nitrogen, right? So what's, so 893 times 3, 2679 moles of hydrogen. Do we have 2,679 moles of hydrogen? No, we only have 2,500. So which one's limiting? Right. So hydrogen is limiting. That means that not all 893 moles of nitrogen will react. Some of it will be left over. Now, let's answer the second question. The reason we needed to know the limiting one first is because if we're going to calculate the mass of ammonia, we're going to do one of those calculations from the previous page where we start with moles of this, make it moles of this, and then grams of this, right? But we can start with two numbers. We can either start with the 893 from nitrogen or the 2500 from hydrogen. Which one are we going to use based on our answer to number one? The hydrogen, because that one's limiting. We can only make as much ammonia as the hydrogen we have, not the nitrogen. We have extra nitrogen. So for this one, we're going to take that 2,500 moles of hydrogen. And what do we multiply it by to figure out how much ammonia we would make? Right, three moles of hydrogen makes three moles of ammonia. So we have a ratio of moles to moles, which is one, right? So that's how many moles of ammonia we're going to make. And then to find the mass, we can do that, right? We're going to look at grams per mole, um, which for ammonia is about 17. So that comes to about 28.2 kilograms. Oh, yeah, 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 good point. Yeah, we, we got the wrong equation up here. We caught that. So this should be 2 to 3, um, which means I should have put, end up with that many moles of ammonia. <laughs> OK. So then for the, for the last part, we need to know how much of the excess reagent remains. Well, which one is the excess reagent going to be? The nitrogen, right? Because hydrogen is limiting, so there's excess nitrogen. So we know we used 2,500 moles of hydrogen, right? Because that was limiting. So how many moles of nitrogen did we need to react with those? We do the same kind of calculation. 2,500 moles of hydrogen times um, one mole of nitrogen per each three mole of hydrogen gives you 833 moles of nitrogen needed. So if you're going to use 2,500 moles of hydrogen, you need 833 moles of nitrogen. And how much nitrogen do we actually have? 893.
So we put in 893 moles of nitrogen. So the leftover will be 893 minus 833, or 60 moles nitrogen. So we have moles left over. It, would, so it should be specified. It just says how much, so that could be whatever. But uh, usually it'll ask for the actual quantity, the, the um, measure left over in mass. But you could convert that to, to, the, to grams, right? All right, so that is, that's all you can really do in these kinds of problems. They're always like this. They're always basically the same. They just ask about one thing or another. Or they ask how much of this would you have to put in, or how much of this can you make. Or they can ask, let's say you want to get 1,000 grams of ammonia. How much nitrogen do you need? How much hydrogen do you need? Those are the kinds of questions that will come up here. And uh, the end of chapter four is full of practice ones like this. So go through them. Work, work them out, um, and you'll be fine. Now, let's see if you can do one, and then we'll talk about this, which we've already sort of talked about, uh, theoretical yield. So let's look at this one first, see if you can do this either on your own or maybe together. <laughs> Nitrogen gas can be prepared by passing gaseous ammonia over sopper, solid copper oxide, copper two oxide. The other products of the reaction are solid copper and water vapor. If a sample containing that much ammonia is reacted with that much copper oxide, which is the limiting reagent. And how many grams of nitrogen will be formed? So see if you can set this up in the same way as the previous one. You're going to need a balanced equation. You're going to need your quantity to go from grams to moles. And then you're going to use the mole ratios to figure out the answers to those two questions the same way we, ways we just did. A lot of good work's going on. That's the equation, right? Is it balanced? No. How do you balance it? Match up. Yep, looks good. Okay, so there's our equation. How many moles? So I, you always know you have to get to moles first, so we'll just do that. Uh, the 18.1 grams of NH3 ends up being 1.06 moles, right? And the copper oxide ends up being 1.14 moles or 1.13 maybe. All right. So if, uh, if that's true, then which one is limiting? Well, let's look at it. If we have if we have 1.06 moles of ammonia, then how much copper oxide do we need? Well, to figure that out, we multiply that by the atomic or the molar ratio. And what do you get? So that's how much you would need. Do we have that much? Or do we have more or do we have less? We have less because we only have 1.14. So that means that which one is limiting? Yep. So based on the molar ratios in the equation, we need 1.59 moles of copper oxide for everything to react. 
but we actually have only 1.14 moles of copper oxide. So that one is limiting. Yeah. I did it the other way. I did grams. Yeah. You did grams. I found the grams of each. Okay. Yeah, I suppose. So you added up these two masses, or no? Okay. Yeah. Have you got the right thing? I think so. I think so. Let's check it at some point to make sure. Okay, so then copper oxide is limiting. So then how do we figure out how much nitrogen will be formed? Right, you use your limiting moles, which is 1.14. And then the ratio here is 1 to 3 between copper oxide and nitrogen. Right. So you've got one mole of nitrogen per three moles of copper oxide, which is 0.38 ish, right? Yeah. Or 10.6 grams. So you should come up with that you should make 10.6 grams of nitrogen. All right? All right, so that's limiting reagent problem. Now, this next part, theoretical yield and actual yield, we've actually done this already. Theoretical yield is how much of a product do you expect to make given a full reaction. So you'll notice, like, like in this one, right, what we just did, we took our limiting reactant, and we figured out how much product it should make, 10.6 grams of nitrogen. Now, in an actual reaction in the real world, that will never happen. You can't, well, I mean, maybe there's some instances, but generally, there are always little, little things that happen in a chemical reaction that makes your yield less than 100%. So instead of 10.6 grams of nitrogen, you'd get 10.5, or 9, or 8, or 2, some amount less than that, because in the real world, there are all kinds of effects on chemical reactions, um, some of which are mistakes or things that you do wrong. But actually, you can do a reaction perfectly, totally correctly, and it will still not make 100% for various reasons, um, equilibrium and all this other stuff going on. So when we do an actual reaction in the lab, we want to know, OK, we got this much out at the end of this reaction. How does that compare to how much the calculation tells us we should have gotten? And that's what's known as actual yield versus theoretical yield. So what we can do is take a problem like this. Methanol right, is uh, manufactured by combination of carbon monoxide and hydrogen is one way to do it. You react these two things. We can calculate the theoretical yield. That is, how much do we expect to get? And then if we actually produce this much, what is the percent yield? That means. What is the ratio between what we actually make, made and what we were hoping to make based on the perfect situation? All right. So let's do that, that completely. Now here's another thing to watch. From here on out, any time you're given a, a problem like this where you have to figure out some quantities of some stuff put together, you have to keep limiting reactant in your head. All right. I'm not going to. I or the book or anybody is never going to be specific and say, this is a limiting reactant problem. Figure out the limiting reactant. Or this is not a limiting reactant problem. Just do the calculations. We're not going to be that explicit. We're just going to say, here's some stuff put together. Figure out how, how much is made. And it's going to be up to you to figure out if there's actually a stoichiometric mix or if one of these things is limiting. So let's do this one together. Carbon monoxide plus hydrogen produces methanol. Is that balanced? No. no. 
We need two hydrogens, right? Okay. Right? Okay. Now we take our masses that we're given and convert them to moles. So we're given 68.5 kilograms of carbon monoxide and 8.6 kilograms of hydrogen. And I'll just tell you these. I know you can do this calculation. This is... 2446 moles and then 8.60 kilograms of hydrogen is 4300 moles okay which one is limiting? Or is neither limiting? Are they actually in perfect balance? What do you think? The hydrogen is limiting. Why? Not quite. Right. So the, according to the equation, we need two molecules of hydrogen for every one of CO. Which means if we had 2446 moles of CO, we would need double that in hydrogen, which is, what would you say? Uh, 4,892. Uh, 4, so we need 4,892 moles of hydrogen to react with 2,446 moles of carbon monoxide. We don't have 4,892 moles of hydrogen. We have 4,300. So that means hydrogen is limiting because we don't have enough to fully react with all of the carbon monoxide that's there. OK. So then how, <coughs> excuse me, how do we calculate the theoretical yield of methanol? How much methanol do we expect to get? Right. So we're going to take the 4,300 moles of hydrogen, since that's limiting. And we look at the equation, and we see that for every two moles of hydrogen, we make one mole of methanol. So two moles of hydrogen, one mole of methanol. So that means we expect to make 2,150 moles of methanol. And then we can convert that to grams. That comes up to 3.57 times 10 to the fourth grams of methanol. Is that just division? It's just division. So you take the 3.57 divided by, yep. you take that whole value divided by the theoretical yield. Right, so the percent yield, yep, the percent yield is the actual 
over the theoretical in grams, which in this case is 3.57 times 10 to the fourth divided by 6.88 times 10 to the fourth. Yeah, well, times 100%. So this ratio is 0.519 or 51.9%. So you got about a 50% yield. Now, I want to also stress with this that the percent yield does not, is not necessarily a measure of how well you did in doing this reaction. Like, you're going to be doing reactions in lab you can't expect to get 100% yield. That's not the goal. The goal is to do the reaction, you know, and get what you get. And obviously you want a higher yield if you can, but you can't expect that reactions will go to 100% yield most of the time. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you got a 51% yield, 52% yield, doesn't mean that anything went wrong. Maybe that's just as well as this reaction can possibly work. Maybe that's the best yield you can get from this process. There are a lot of factors that, that govern that. But it is something you always want to look at so that you know in the future, let's say you're planning some reactions in a lab because you want to make a certain quantity of something. If you know that this reaction only has a 50% yield, you can plan accordingly and double what you start with for what you want to make. All right. So that's yield. OK, um, rather than go into solutions, I think we'll stop there um, and we'll go into solutions on Wednesday. Thank <laughs> you.